Excellent. Well, good morning. How, how is everybody doing this morning? Good? Excellent. Uh, before we begin, uh, why don't we just have a quick word of prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So, the Gospel of Luke is uh, what we're going to be looking at over the next six weeks, I think it is. Uh, it takes us right to Pentecost anyway, uh, at which point we're going to start looking at the book of Acts. So it's a fun little double barreled thing um, that we've got ahead of us. Um, and I suppose you're probably wondering why all the... Well, it's gone, but uh, why all the, the courtroom stuff? The, uh, the gavels and the statues of justice and... Yeah, why all that? Uh, are we going to be doing the, the classic atonement metaphor of a courtroom for six weeks? Thankfully not. Um, one of my favourite TV shows is uh, Boston Legal. I don't know if you know it, um, but uh, Liz got me onto it early on when we were dating and, and I was a fan of William Shatner because my dad liked Star Trek and then I became more of a fan of William Shatner, uh, much to Liz's dismay because he's not a very pleasant character in the show. But um, A lot of my high school friends uh, ended up as lawyers, actually, and uh, I would have too if I hadn't been convinced at 17 years old that God wanted me to be a rock star. Um, as it is... Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm standing up here pretending to be a lawyer, um, but that's all right. Um, you can imagine then that I was quite excited when the ministry team were looking at the Gospel of Luke and thinking about what angle to take on it for our series when uh, I learnt that you can look at the Gospel of Luke through the lens of a courtroom drama. Um, so that's what we're going to be doing for these six weeks. Uh, and today, what we're going to do is we're going to lay a lot of the groundwork for that. So we're going to do some of our own work looking at um, the context and the history of the book. And then we're also going to look at um, the groundwork that Luke himself lays in uh, the first few chapters. So I suppose the first question uh, is, who is Luke? Um, and the first thing to know is that Luke is not identified in either of the books that are attributed to him. So both the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts are anonymous. Um, the reason that we, we believe that Luke wrote it is largely church tradition. The early fathers said it was Luke and we've come to accept it. Now, pretty much all New Testament scholars agree that whoever wrote Luke and Acts was the same person. They don't necessarily agree that it was the man named Luke that we find in the book of Philemon. Uh, Paul describes Luke as a companion of his, uh, and in the book of uh, Colossians, he describes him as a physician. Um, and... It wasn't necessarily this guy. Church tradition says it was, and maybe it was. Scholars uh, don't necessarily agree, but what scholars do largely agree on is that whoever it was was almost certainly a historical eyewitness and a companion of Paul. So we're just going to call him Luke. Is that okay? He may not have been Luke, but we're just going to call him Luke. Good. Excellent. So the next question that we need to ask is, what is the genre of Luke? Uh, now, Luke is a, is a gospel. It's one of four. And um, typically, we like to divide the gospels into lots of three and one. So we like to lump Matthew, Mark, and Luke together, and we call them the synoptic gospels. And we have John over here being um, different and special. Um, 
But in, in, in another sense, it's actually Matthew, Mark, and John that are the same, and it's Luke that is different. And the reason is because Matthew, Mark, and John are biographies of Jesus. They are about Jesus, this person um, who, you know, the writers want to lift up and want to tell us is praiseworthy and we should imitate him. Luke is different. And we're going to demonstrate that. We're going to look at the very first verse of each of the Gospels. So we're going to have Matthew on the screen. This is Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. This is a record of the ancestors of Jesus, the Messiah, a descendant of David and of Abraham. Okay, Mark chapter 1, verse 1. This is the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. And then it goes on. Uh, John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Sort of different, but not really. It's still talking about Jesus. Luke chapter 1, verse 1 is different. Luke chapter 1, verse 1 says, Many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. It doesn't mention Jesus. In the other Gospels, the very first verse all mention Jesus in some way or another. Luke doesn't. In fact, Luke doesn't mention Jesus until verse 31, when the angel says to Mary, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. But importantly, Jesus still doesn't actually, he's not actually born yet. I was going to say he doesn't exist, but he does exist, you know, pre-incarnate and all that. But in terms of the human being, he's not born yet. Jesus as a character doesn't appear in Luke until chapter 2, verse 7. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. So, what is Luke concerned with then if in his introduction he doesn't really talk about Jesus? If we just flip back to Luke 1.1, 1, 1, uh, actually, it's... Uh, it's on the next slide as well. That's great. I was prepared. Uh, many people have set out to write accounts about the events that have been fulfilled among us. It's the events. It's the events that Luke is interesting. Not so much the person. The person's important. The person was very much involved in the events. But it's the events that Luke is interested in. Luke is writing not a biography of Jesus. Luke is writing a history of the founding of Christianity. He's not concerned primarily with Jesus. He's concerned primarily with the movement that Jesus began. Luke is also the only gospel that has a sequel. Luke 2, the Roman Empire strikes back. Really hoping for a bigger laugh for that one. That's all right. <laughs> um, so when you take these together, what you see is a history of early Christianity. You have in Acts the story of the Christian religion as it was under Peter and Paul, and in Luke you have the story of the Christian religion as it was founded by its founder. So you take them together, and it's really a story of Christianity rather than a biography of Jesus. So that's just going to help the way we're thinking about it. We think about it a little bit differently to the way we might think about Matthew, Mark, and John. So the next question is, uh, who was Luke writing his book for? Uh, and we see that in, uh, in verse 3. They use the eyewitness reports circulating among us from the early disciples and in verse 3, he says, Having carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I also have decided to write an accurate account for you, most honourable Theophilus, so you can be certain of the truth of everything you were taught. So, who was Theophilus? Now, a lot of people think, and, and perhaps you've heard, that Theophilus is a non-specific address. So... Uh, Theophilus means the name, it means lover of God. So maybe Luke was just writing like a, like a dear Christian letter 
you know what I mean? Like Christian, it's a name, but also, dear Christian, this is the story of what happened. So some people think it's that. Um, but uh, I think that's unlikely. And when I say I think that's unlikely, the people who I read to do the research for this sermon think it's unlikely. Um, because when we have people writing letters like that addressed to um, the body of Christians, they do it a little bit differently. So Peter does it like this. He says, this letter is from Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. I am writing to God's chosen people who are living as foreigners in the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Uh, and when John does it, he's uh, typically a little bit more poetic than Peter is. Peter's rather blunt. John is rather flowery. John says, this letter is from John the Elder. I am writing to the chosen lady and to her children, whom I love in the truth, as does everyone else who knows the truth. And if you cast your mind back to when we went through the letters of John uh, a few months ago last year, um, Simon told us that the chosen lady and her children is the church rather than a specific lady. So these are two people who are writing to the church. They start with this, you know, with this greeting. Um, but, but Luke doesn't do that. He, it's, it's not formatted the same way. The structure really reads like he's talking to a person, not like he's writing a letter to the church. And this isn't actually that surprising as much as Theophilus means lover of God. It was a fairly common name, not unlike Christian is currently a fairly common name. So it's not unreasonable to think that Theophilus was a real person. Um, and the other clue is in this phrase, most excellent. Now, the NLT actually translates it as most honourable Theophilus, um, but other versions translate it as most excellent Theophilus. Okay? Um, and it's the same word, regardless of how it's tra translated as honourable or excellent, it's the same word that appears in three other places in Luke's writing. All of these places are very formal settings, always addressing a Roman nobleman. So uh, here they are on the screen. This is Luke 1.3, uh, most excellent Theophilus, uh, from Acts chapter 23.26, from Claudius Lysias to His Excellency, Governor Felix. Greetings. Again, that most excellent, His Excellency. Uh, Acts chapter 4, chapter 24, 2. When Paul was called in, Tertullus presented the charges against Paul in the following address to the governor. You have provided a long period of peace for us Jews and with foresight have enacted reforms for us. For all of this, Your Excellency, we are very grateful to you. Again, your excellency, most excellent Roman nobleman judge person. Chapter 26, verse 25, but Paul replied, I am not insane, most excellent Festus. What I am saying is the sober truth. This phrase, this most excellent, your excellency, his excellency, their excellency, works kind of like your honour in courtroom dramas. You address the judge as your honour, which is... Obviously, why the NLT translates it as most honourable, it's a little bit more familiar to us. But it is only used in this particular grammatical way in ancient literature in legal petitions. That's the only way it's ever used. So probably Luke is using it in the same way. So we can guess then that Theophilus was a Roman nobleman, somehow connected to the Roman courts. Okay? Here's some other reasons we might think that this is what's, what's Luke doing. And that is, Luke is very nice about Romans. Matthew is not so nice about Romans. Mark is not very nice about Romans. John is John. Luke is very nice about Romans. There are no Roman soldiers who mock Jesus at his crucifixion in Luke. Herod's soldiers do. Roman soldiers don't appear in Luke's version of the story. At Jesus' trial, 
Luke portrays Pilate as a wise and diligent judge, searching for a way to find this obviously innocent man, searching for a way to, to not execute him, basically. Matthew portrays Pilate as a bit of a buffoon. Uh, there's an incident in Luke chapter 13 we're going to read about. About this time, Jesus was informed that Pilate had murdered some people from Galilee as they were offering sacrifices at the temple. Which, uh, you know, isn't, isn't you know, a, a good thing to be saying about the governor. You can imagine that Jesus at this point is probably going to be critical of Pilate's acts of violence. But actually, what Jesus said is, do you think those Galileans were worse sinners than all the other people from Galilee? Is that why they suffered? Not at all. And you will perish too unless you repent of your sins and turn to God. Jesus isn't interested in criticising Pilate in this particular instance. Or if he did, Luke doesn't record it because Luke wants to portray the Romans in a positive light. He doesn't want to create antagonism from Roman people like Theophilus who are associated with the judicial system. So uh, why is he writing to a Roman judge, attorney, court clerk, something? Don't really know. Somehow connected to the courts. The answer is that his friend, Paul, was on trial. He was on trial in Rome. And Luke is writing his gospel, his account of the events, to Theophilus, possibly submitting it as some sort of defence of Paul. Now, if this is the case, then we should be able to look through the Gospel of Luke and find how Luke addresses the charges against Paul in the way he frames the events of Jesus' life. So what were the charges against Paul? Uh, in a word, nonsense. So in Acts 26.32... Uh, Paul is at the end of his fifth trial that uh, the book of Acts records, and um, Agrippa, who is uh, the Jewish puppet king, uh, is talking to Festus, who is the Roman governor, and Agrippa says he could have been set free if he hadn't appealed to Caesar. Paul has done nothing wrong. These charges are nonsense, uh, but unfortunately he's appealed to Caesar, so to Caesar he must go. So if the charges are nonsense, and Paul is quite clearly innocent, what we can assume then is that the Jewish leaders who are prosecuting Paul aren't really trying to prosecute Paul for something that Paul has done, since he quite obviously hasn't done it. What they're really trying to attack is Christianity. And Paul is just a figurehead. In this case, what they really want to do is they want to put an end to Christianity. And with Christianity on trial, its founder, Jesus, his beliefs, his teachings, are also on trial. So what are the charges against Paul? We find them in Acts chapter 24. We have found this man to be a troublemaker who is constantly stirring up riots among the Jews all over the world. He's a disturber of the peace. He causes trouble. He is a ringleader of the cult known as the Nazarenes. Furthermore, he was trying to desecrate the temple when we arrested him. 
So we can expect Luke to try and show that Christianity is not a disturber of the peace. In fact, Christianity is uh, good for society. We can imagine that's probably what Luke is going to try and tell us. Luke is also going to try and tell us that Christianity is not a cult or a sect or somehow different to Judaism. It's the same as Judaism. The reason this is important is because of all the religions in the Roman Empire, only Judaism had religious freedom. The Romans had worked out with great difficulty that you don't mess with the religion of the Jewish people. You can force everyone else to worship the emperor as a god. You cannot force the Jewish people to do that unless you want riots and chaos and all this sort of thing. So they left the Jews alone. If Christianity is Jewish, Christianity is allowed the same religious freedom. If it's not Jewish, then they can't be setting up this Jesus as somehow greater than Caesar. So this is what the Jewish people are trying to prove. It's not Jewish. They're not allowed to do that. And lastly, he was trying to desecrate the temple when we arrested him. He's trying to violate Jewish religious freedom. And a violation of Jewish religious freedom is against Roman law. And it's the only instance in which the Jewish people are allowed to execute someone. We just had Easter. You probably remember that the Jewish people, the Jewish leaders, they couldn't execute Jesus. They had to get the Romans to do it. But if this other non-Jewish religion is violating their religious freedom and desecrating their temple, that's the only instance in which they're allowed to execute him. So uh, we'll probably find that Luke is trying to demonstrate that that didn't happen. So that's the main person that um, Luke is talking to, Theophilus. Um, but Luke has a secondary audience as well. And that is the children of Abraham. First and foremost, he's talking to the Jewish leaders who are prosecuting Paul. He has a very, very bleak portrayal of the Pharisees, the Jewish leaders. This is pretty common amongst the Gospels. None of them are big fans of the Jewish leaders. But Luke's portrayal of them is is even less nice than others. And I'll give you an example. We just had Palm Sunday, and I'm sure you remember, Jesus comes into the city, and the crowds are cheering, and they're crying Hosanna, and they're waving palm branches, and they're having a great time. In Matthew, Mark, and John, they just talk about the crowd. Probably mostly Jewish, just a crowd. Luke specifies that it's a crowd of Jesus' disciples. It's not a crowd of Jewish people, broadly. It's a crowd of Jesus' disciples. And in Luke alone, the Pharisees come to Jesus and say, can you shut your disciples up, please? That doesn't happen in the other Gospels. Luke's portrayal of the Jewish religious leaders is darker. A major theme in Luke's gospel is the impending doom coming to this generation of Jewish people. Don't Google that. If you Google impending doom of the Jews, as I discovered, you find a lot of anti-Semitic hits. It wasn't what I was looking for. I'm probably on some sort of federal police hit list now. Um, But that's a major theme. Jesus talks about Uh, the coming doom for the Jewish people of that generation, but he doesn't wish that doom on them. He's not gleeful about it. He weeps, Luke chapter 19, but as he, Jesus, came closer to Jerusalem and saw the city ahead, he began to weep. How I wish today that you of all people would understand the way to peace, but now it is too late and peace is hidden from your eyes. Before long, your enemies will build ramparts against your walls and encircle you and close in on you from every side. They will crush you into the ground and your children with you. Your enemies will not leave a single stone in place because you did not recognize it when God visited you. 
He doesn't want this to happen. He's saying it will if you don't recognise God visiting you. Jesus continually offers hope if the Jewish people turn and repent. Paul, when he's in prison, calls the gospel the hope of Israel. And this hope, this this way to avoid doom, the doom that Jesus talks about, can be summed up in one word, and that word is salvation. I'm sure you're all familiar with the concept of salvation. We like to talk about it a lot. But Matthew doesn't use the word. Mark doesn't use the word. John only uses it once. It is all the way through Luke. All of our ideas about salvation, they come from the gospel of Luke. Luke is concerned with salvation. Luke is the only one to refer to Jesus as saviour, except for John, but again, he only does it once. Luke constantly calls Jesus the saviour. Luke constantly uses the verb to save. Sometimes it's translated healed, sometimes it's translated made whole, but it's the same word, save. Luke is concerned with salvation for the Jewish people, his secondary audience. But salvation is for the Gentiles too. The very last bit of dialogue in Luke's writings comes from Paul in Acts 28. So I want you to know that this salvation from God has also been offered to the Gentiles and they will accept it. So we are a part of Luke's secondary audience. If you are not a true Jew, says Paul in Romans, just because you were born of Jewish parents or because you've gone through the ceremony of circumcision... No, a true Jew is one whose heart is right with God. And true circumcision is not merely obeying the letter of the law. Rather, it is a change of heart produced by the Spirit. And a person with a changed heart seeks praise from God, not from people. John the Baptist says, early in the Gospel of Luke, "...prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God." Don't just say to each other, we're safe, for we are descendants of Abraham. That means nothing. For I tell you, God can create children of Abraham from these very stones. And he didn't do it from the stones. He did it from the Gentiles. So while Luke's secondary audience, first and foremost, is the Jewish people who are prosecuting Paul, it's anyone who is a children of Abraham. So, as we look through the Gospel of Luke over the next few weeks, what is Luke saying to Theophilus? How is Luke framing the story of Christianity to help defend it in a Roman court? And what is Luke saying to us, the children of Abraham? He lays some groundwork in the first three chapters. And we're not going to read all of the first three chapters, but I encourage you to go and do that in your own time and and see how Luke answers these two questions. But uh, for a brief overview, in the first three chapters, he links Jesus with John the Baptist and he contrasts Mary with Zechariah. Firstly, the angel Gabriel predicts John's birth, John's birth, and then the angel Gabriel predicts Jesus' birth. We read about Zechariah in Luke chapter 1. It's probably a few slides down. There we go. When Herod was king of Judea, there was a Jewish priest named Zechariah, a Jewish priest, first character, Jewish priest, the same people who are accusing Paul. There was a Jewish priest named Zechariah who was a member of the priestly order of Abijah and his wife Elizabeth was also from the priestly line of Aaron. So kind of like a super priest, right? A 
We're talking about the, the Jewish priests are, are accusing Paul. Well, he's the priestliest of priests. They were righteous in God's eyes. They were careful to obey all of the Lord's commandments and regulations. While Zechariah was in the sanctuary, while he was serving in the temple, the very place that Paul was supposed to have profaned, an angel of the Lord appeared to him. This is on the next slide. Standing to the right of the incense altar. Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him. But the angel said, Don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife Elizabeth will give you a son, and you are to name him John. How does Zechariah, the priestliest of all priests, respond to this direct message from God? He goes, How can I be sure this will happen? I'm an old man now. And my wife is also well along in years. I don't believe you. And the angel responds, I am Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God. It was he who sent me to bring you this good news. But now, since you didn't believe what I said, you will be silent and unable to speak until the child is born. For my words will certainly be fulfilled at the proper time. Then Luke tells us a story about Mary directly after to contrast with Zechariah. Mary isn't a priest. Mary's just a, you know, an, an average Jewish teenage girl. She's nobody special. In the sixth months of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the same angel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favoured woman, the Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary. The same thing Gabriel had to say to Zechariah, don't be afraid. If you have found favour with God, you will conceive and give birth to a son and you will name him Jesus. Much the same thing that the angel said to Zechariah. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. This is the hope of Israel. Luke is planting this seed right at the beginning of the book that he's talking about the hope of Israel. That although there's doom and gloom coming to the Jewish leaders, that's not the point. The point is there's hope if they will believe in God's promise. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I am a virgin. And uh, the angel responds, and then Mary says, I'm the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. Now, there's a subtle difference in Mary's response to Zechariah's response. Zechariah says, how can I be sure this will happen? Mary says, how can this happen? Mary's response isn't tinged with unbelief. She believes it. She would like to know how, if that's all right. Please and thank you. But she believes it. Zechariah doesn't believe it. The the super priest doesn't believe a direct message from God. The plain, ordinary Jewish teenage girl does. And then we start to see... We know, of course, that eventually Zechariah does believe and he gets to speak again and... um, Zechariah confesses his son's role to give knowledge of salvation. And that's uh, a couple of slides over. Oh, this is Mary's response. Mary's response, how my spirit rejoices in God, my saviour. Zechariah's response is next. You will tell his people how to find salvation through forgiveness of their sins. Saviour, salvation. And John is born and Jesus is born and a multitude of angels celebrate the coming of the Saviour. Yes, the Messiah, the Lord, who has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. They take Jesus to the temple and Simeon's eyes get to see for themselves God's salvation embodied in baby Jesus. Sovereign Lord, now let your servant die in peace 
as you have promised. I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is a light to reveal God to the nations, and he is the glory of your people, Israel. So Luke is establishing John's credentials and Jesus' credentials at the same time. Christianity is Jewish because John was predicted by Isaiah. Isaiah had spoken of John when he said, He is a voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. The valleys will be filled and the mountains and hills made level. The curves will be straightened and the rough places made smooth. And in every other gospel, the quote from Isaiah ends there. In Luke, it continues, and then all people will see the salvation sent from God. Then goes on to describe what the salvation looks like. The crowds ask, what should we do? And John replied, if you have two shirts, give one to the poor. If you have food, share it with those who are hungry. Even corrupt tax collectors came to be baptized and asked Jesus, our teacher, what should we do? And he replied, collect no more taxes than the government requires. What should we do? Asked some soldiers. John replied, don't extort money or make false accusations and be content with your pay. Hope is coming. The poor will be clothed. The hungry will be fed. You're still allowed to take taxes, though. Because remember, he doesn't want to upset the Romans. He's not saying don't take any tax. He's just saying don't take more tax than what the government says you have to. Even in this moment of, you know, we talk about Jesus' kingdom flipping the social order upside down with the poor being looked after and the hungry being lifted up and everything. But even in this moment, you can still take the appropriate government-sanctioned tax. So John's credentials are to point to to salvation and then Jesus' credentials. One day when the crowds were being baptised, Jesus himself was baptised. As he was praying, the heavens opened and the Holy Spirit in bodily form form, descended on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, You are my dearly loved son and you bring me great joy. He is the son of God. And then Luke goes on all the way to verse 38 detailing Jesus' genealogy, long past where Matthew does, all the way to God. He's trying to say that Jesus is the Son of God, Jesus is the salvation that John is here to bring. These two are linked. So to Theophilus, Luke is saying, the prosecutors who are prosecuting my friend Paul, they can't necessarily be trusted. Zechariah didn't believe God. Just because you're a priest who serves in the temple doesn't mean you are listening to God. The prosecutors can't be trusted. But God can be trusted. Zechariah encountered an angel, and what the angel said would happen, happened. God can be trusted. Jesus is the promised salvation. He's a fulfillment of the promises of Judaism. It's an extension. It's not different. It's not a sect. It's not a cult. It deserves the same religious freedom. And the teachings of salvation are good for society. They're not disturbing the peace. The poor are going to be clothed. The hungry are going to be fed. This is good. This isn't riots. This isn't chaos. It's even a little bit pro-government. We like tax. And what is Jesus saying to us? Jesus is our promised salvation. How can I be sure? asks Zechariah. You can be certain, says Luke. You can be certain of what you have been taught. But listening to people, just because they're priests who serve in the temple, or in our context, just because they wield some sort of significant cultural influence, doesn't necessarily mean that they can be trusted, doesn't necessarily mean that they're listening to God. 
those who won't listen to God's plan for the world's salvation, will have nothing of value to say. They maybe won't be literally silenced like Zechariah was. But they don't have anything of value to contribute to our knowledge of God's plan. We can know God's plan to save us, to turn us back to him. And we've reached the end of chapter 3 of Luke and we haven't actually heard from Jesus yet because it's not a story about Jesus, it's a story about Christianity. But over the next few years, we will start to hear from Jesus and Luke has laid the groundwork for us so that we are ready to listen to him and what he has to say about our salvation. Let's pray. Loving God, thank you that you do offer us salvation. Thank you that you offer us a way back to you. Thank you that you are willing to go on record in a Roman courtroom to tell us about your plan for salvation. Please speak to our hearts over the next few weeks and convict us here and now of what Luke wanted us to know. That salvation is here. Jesus has come. And restoration is available to us. Amen.